But what exactly does education, as we think of it, lead people to achieve? We all know people with advanced economic degrees, very smart folks, who maybe have a low standard of living. They're not exactly living the life. So what's missing from the syllabus? How about the pursuit of wealth and legacy building, modern politics and power structure, technology, class consciousness? How about a focus on learning to break the rules? Are those lessons that are keeping hardworking, smart students from going on to garner the wealth, influence, and connections of, say, the vampire squid? Well, let's see, because stepping out of his role as heavy-hitting financial analyst, today Reggie Middleton is stepping in as educational analyst. Turns out, add to his bag of tricks, he's also been a teacher for his kids. Uh, we're going to hear why he is uh, so hard on the educational system today and what some of his solutions are. Reggie, it's nice to see you there in New York, looking good as always. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh <laughs> Go ahead. Dear Mr. Middleton, I very much enjoyed your writings on group things. The and least elites elites and american 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 ed up credence education education it reminds me of how all the funds climbing claiming claiming to have unique unique quantitative 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 analytics analytics all failed 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 the, the same way you I want you to tell everybody what I'm reading. Okay. This is my five year old daughter, Mariama. And I'm reading a message and it's for grown ups. Mm -hmm. And I'm just five. I'm not even six. She's just five <laughs> years old. And I want everybody to know that I had an argument with her school and her teacher mm -hmm. because they said she couldn't read in September. And but I wrote, I, I read a yeah. message that's for... I read. I read a <laughs> message that's for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. This is an email that I got. And this, I'm going to read the next sentence so you know who the email is for. It says, I am in the intellectual property business, which suffers not only from groupthink, but punishes creative ways to generate money from IP. We are supposedly an IP economy. Okay, we but know we the don't drill. Like the U.S. is falling behind IP other nations in education. That creates real but what impact is this having on the U.S. economic recovery and the problems with American education? Are they really what we think? Well, first, let's take a step back to see how the U.S. stacks up. Here are some fun factoids I found today from the OECD. The USA ranks 16th in proportion of young people with a college degree in the group of countries that the OECD includes. There's about 34. Uh, American students ranked 25th in math and 21st in science compared to 30 industrialized countries. America's top math students rank 25th out of 30 countries when compared with top students elsewhere in the world. Higher education costs in the U.S. Uh, are the highest in the OECD area. And here was a particularly depressing part of the report about who will fill those expensive spots. This is verbatim. verbatim. With 42% of 15-year-old students scoring below proficiency level 3 in reading, it will become increasingly difficult to supply institutions of higher education with students who are able to follow and complete their studies. Oh, great. So basically, American students are becoming too dumb even to go on to pay more for college than in any other industrialized nation. This has led people like U.S. President Barack Obama to stress right. education. So you're a financial important. analyst. We are used to you coming on here and sparing no words when it comes to something like Goldman Sachs 
uh, and, and what the vampire squid is missing when it comes to financial uh, analysis. But what inspired you to go after uh, the American educational system? Well, I don't feel I'm going after the American education system. I'm pretty much calling it as it is. Uh, you know, I've had experience with it. I was born and raised in America. I have three children. Um, and I've been through um, the education system at least four times personally between myself and the three children. Uh, at first, I was naive, um, thinking that the American education system was not working. Uh, and with that ideal, you know, you're basically banging your head against a brick wall. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you, once you take a step back and learn um, basically how things work, you realize that the education system is working if the goal of the education system is to create fodder for the higher capitalist classes to uh, increase their wealth. Uh, basically, you need a bunch of foot soldiers to uh, fight a war, and not everybody could be a general. And uh, that is, in a nutshell, if I had to encapsulate it in one sentence, uh, what the American education system is doing. Unfortunately, as industry changes and you go from uh, an industrial and manufacturing society to an information-based service society, uh, that model, that mindset tends to fall apart and that risks having the entire country fall behind, potentially fall behind other countries in terms of economic output. So let's really break this down, Reggie, because kind of the core of what you get to in your blog post that you wrote recently was that academic education is not the solution. You kind of just talked a little bit about why. You went on in your blog to say that this is creating uh, an army of slaves or a slave army of rule followers. So what really is the solution to that that you think will help people actually advance as opposed to becoming workers? The solution is um, to teach the students in school how to be successful um, in lieu of teaching them how to pass the test um, with said test basically empower, um, preparing students to work for somebody else. Now success uh, as a definition, my, I'll use my personal definition, does not necessarily encompass being making more money or more money than somebody else. Success is basically accomplishing your goals with the goal should be freedom and happiness. Uh, in a capitalistic society, it is very difficult to have freedom, independence, uh, without any, some form of wealth. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be very difficult to leave wealth out of the equation, but I also don't want any of your listeners to think that this is a wild dash for money, like mm -hmm. uh, Wall Street the movie which is not. It's well, that's, that's a good um, distinction. I want you to make that distinction because you were writing about, you know, money isn't, you teach your kids, money isn't to buy things. Uh, you're talking about the importance of money in a different way. What do you see money and wealth as achieving in this society economically for people? Yeah. Well, I tell my children, um, simply tell them that money is a proxy for labor. Uh, without money, you have to work, and if once you gain money or capital, you can use that money or capital as a proxy for your labor and potentially others' labor. Um, when you ask those who are, um, this is a very controversial topic, but I'm going to come out and say it. Go for it. Lower in the socioeconomic uh, ladder on the lower rungs, you ask many, or the, when I've asked many people what money was or the purpose of money, the first thing out of their mouth is to buy things. You know, money is to buy, and then they usually name, you know, consumer trinkets, you know, electronics, you know, jewelry, cars, etc. But my, from my perspective, and I believe in perspective of those who are successful in building longer term legacies and building wealth, money is a proxy for labor. The more money you have, the less you have to work um, yourself, and the more money you have, the more control you have over other, um, both sources of labor and sources of productive income. And it's, uh, it's leverage, it builds upon itself. Uh, a moderate amount of money begets more money, which becomes a larger amount of money, which begets more money, which becomes an even larger amount, which causes a significant imbalance between the wealthy and those who are not. But if the schools were truly doing their job, they would teach people basically what money is, uh, teach people class consciousness, and create a dash for mobility where everybody would try and climb up the ladder versus being content and sitting in a cubicle making somebody else wealthy. Now, everybody cannot be wealthy. You know, you need worker bees, you need those in the middle, you need those on the top. But if those who are on the top are able to remain there, static in the status quo, without any competition, and then the quality of those on the top tend to stagnate. 
Mm -hmm. And that, in general, creates a stagnant comp uh, country. Mm -hmm. What you want is constant competition mm -hmm. for everybody to call up to the top of the ladder. And, so and you, you have room for mm -hmm. three people on the ladder. There are 100 people. You want to fight with 103 people to get on top. To right get on now, top of that letter. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to have about four or five people competing out of 103. And you make so the point you just that with, don't have the diversity. And you make the point with right, people up there on the top uh, staying the same, getting complacent, that that is really the real threat where countries that are hungry for this, that are fighting for this, that are fighting to be on top, that that's where they're going to make gains over the United States, that that's a real problem, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's it in a nutshell. Okay. So, so let me ask you this then, because uh, you're talking about uh, incorporating things like wealth, the pursuit of wealth, class consciousness in education. Uh, what about the fact, you know, you even point to a sociologist who talked about the power elite and what they do, how they move up the ladder, and they use their connections, they use their insular access to institutions to move up uh, in a way that other people can't. So how are average people ever going to be able to compete with those kind of connections and that kind of status? Well, one thing is to learn. Um, you look at nobody in general, uh, everybody has an equal opportunity until networks are formed to um, insulate that opportunity. So if everybody, if you take this world and shook it up and threw it on the ground, everybody would start from scratch. Everybody would probably have a similar opportunity. Some will climb up and some won't. Those who have climbed up are going to create uh, mechanisms to prevent competition because they don't want to be knocked down from the top of the ladder. One way to get up there is to learn how everybody else got to the top. Mm -hmm. So if you learn how everybody else got to the top, you replicate uh, the methods that they use to get to the top. That should be the purpose of schooling, okay? But schools don't teach that. They don't teach you how to get to the top. You know, your first grader, your average fifth grader doesn't learn entrepreneurialism in school. They definitely don't learn class structure, mm -hmm. class consciousness. They don't use, they don't learn geopolitical power structures. You know, these things are foreign. You mm -hmm. know, I, you talk to a kindergarten or first grade teacher, and there are, some of them are still stuck on things such as uh, penmanship and grammar. You know, of course, there's a place for that, but um, when you have entire school systems and entire cities focused on how to pass an academic test versus how to make more competitive children, then you're breaking the system and you're creating, you know, also rants in the school system. You know, you bring up a lot Nobody of... Nobody gets paid. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make this point. Yeah, yeah. Nobody that I know of personally gets paid for passing, taking a test. I can't think of one person. It might be different down there in D.C., but I don't know anybody <laughs> who gets paid for taking tests. I don't know anybody that gets paid for taking a test either. But I do know people that get paid for breaking rules. And I think it's interesting that you're bringing this up because it's a conversation we've had here amongst the Capital Account team. Because let's just say that I work with some rule breakers and I've noticed the limitations of always growing up being taught to follow the rules, just do what you're told, be the straight A student, that that's how you excel, that that's how you succeed. And then you get it out into the real world and you really learn the value of not always doing what you're told. And you see how much more that can actually get you in terms of uh, innovative thinking and, and taking the actions you need. That's my two cents. I want to continue this conversation with you, Reggie, because I know you think that this all plays into uh, some of the economic problems we're seeing, some of the group think that is continuing the economic problems we're seeing. I want to get into all of those uh, discussions with you. All right, back to independent thinking. Here is one of our favorite examples of it that we caught on to uh, online. Take a look. Because the companies who make these try to trick the girls in, into buying the pink stuff instead of stuff that boys want to buy, right? Right. If she's really got that figured out on her own, I just hope it doesn't get stamped out. But is society and our education system stamping it out? And when these people grow up to be Wall Street analysts, for example, what are they missing? 
Entrepreneurial investor Reggie Middleton is back to tell us. Reggie, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Uh, as far as the people that have grown up in this educational system, gone to the best schools, come from the best families, uh, or made it there and end up on Wall Street, you talk about a group think that this has led to, that has contributed to economic, the economic crisis in 2008 and, and some of the economic problems we see today. How so? Well, um, when everybody crowds to one side of the boat, it doesn't matter if that boat is going in the correct direction. It flips over. Um, that's what happens when you don't have diversity, um, whether it's diversity genetically from idealism or even um, weight distribution on a watercraft. And that's basically what happened um, during the credit crisis. Any, any 10 year old child, okay, can sit there and look at the um, incidences or the events that led up to the crisis and could have pointed out this isn't right, you know, this is unstable and I don't think it's going to end well. But despite that, you have a raft of PhDs, award winning analysts, bankers. Uh, central bankers, politicians, regulators, etc., who somehow did not see this coming, despite the fact it was the largest run-up in housing in the history of this country, even greater than that of the gold rush, despite the fact you had credit flowing to dead people getting mortgages, and uh, despite the fact it was easily seen. Um, the reason is everybody was taught to do the same thing, look at everything the same way. Even as the bubble started busting, um, you had companies who were obviously insolvent, such as Bear Stearns. Um, how many analysts had a sell on Bear Stearns, um, what, four months before they went bank, um, bust? Mm -hmm. Nobody. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think my blog was the only um, entity that publicly declared that Bear Stearns was insolvent. The same for Lehman Brothers. Uh, there were two or three other investors mm -hmm. who uh, were the student investors who did it. Same thing for uh, general growth properties. Mm -hmm. These were obvious imbalances in the system. But the imbalances that couldn't be seen because everybody was taught to look at things the same way, act mm -hmm. the same way. They went to the same schools with the same professors, with the same curricula, with the same ideals, graduated, went to the same um, banks, using the same trades, with the same methods and techniques, with mm -hmm. the same assets. There's yeah. no diversity. That lack of diversity creates you know, a lopsided system. So a Harvard degree didn't mean that you were going to see the financial crisis coming, and in fact, a ton of people missed it. Uh, you saw it. How is this playing out today? Because you're talking about uh, 2012 predictions, how a lot of people see kind of the broader threat to beat Iran. You have your eyes on another country entirely. It's Tell a us really who it is point why. that you bring up. Going back to the point of education, though, uh, just because I want to get to that before we go, uh, you kind of tried your hand at trying to make an impact, uh, make inroads in this area. You uh, taught a class for your kids in schools when you were seeing the impact that, that all of this was having uh, on them. And you ended up getting the boot from the principal because it was just, uh, you know, too successful in your words. So do you have any hope that the education system is going to change? I mean, it seems like a real pipe dream to put into schools what you're actually talking about, uh, thinking they will need. Well, it won't change without a significant paradigm shift. Uh, basically, the system has to be reset. You know, you do understand that what I said when we first started the interview, the education system is working in a way. It's working to create, um, I hate to use the word slaves, but a, a quasi-caste system of workers to um, create wealth for those higher up on the food chain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why when you said when you went to school, you were taught to follow the rules and do this and do that. You know, do understand the rules are there for the reason. Those higher up in the food chain um, created rules to keep you walking the path that they need you to walk. If you break those rules, you compete with them. If you follow those rules, you make them wealthy. That's, okay, a, little, so that's a little conspiratorial what you're saying, Reggie. You really Excuse believe me? that's a little conspiratorial. I got to run. We're almost out of time. But do you really believe it's a concerted effort? Well, I wouldn't call it conspiracy. I see it as uh, plain vanilla. For, let, let's take of a rule as um, uh, you should go and get a job and work for yourself and uh, stick with one company. You do that in lieu of becoming an entrepreneur and competing with those who own that company. If you had a choice and you own the company, would you make a rule that says try your best to be an entrepreneur and compete or come work for me, sit in the cubicle and make uh, a certain wage with security? And the security is alleged security because you see companies going bust regularly.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So do you think it's conspiracy or there's logic behind it? Well, I think that you have some good logic behind it. I appreciate you being on the show and sharing it with us because it's all really interesting stuff. I'm glad that you took off your, uh, well, you still had your financial hat on, but this is an interesting way to apply it that we love all the cowboys that aren't part of the herd here on Capital Account. Thanks, Reggie. That was Reggie Middleton, entrepreneurial investor and a boom-bust blog.